actually the fantastic thing about doing research about retirement is everybody <laughs> can relate to it at some point. Right? Especially so, people. Um, <laughs> some people in a more urgent manner than others. So I want to um, thank Joan and Denise Costoldo for inviting me here today. I wanted to link with the center and it's been on my list of things to do. So this was a really great way to make that link. And I actually have to thank Joan, for introducing me to social theory, because it was your first course in my doctoral program where I actually encountered social theory for the first time in my academic career, and um, actually found a home in that course and in, in the kinds of theories that we talked about in that course. I also want to thank uh, Dana for her support in getting me here and, and setting things up, so thank you very much. So in my talk today, I'm really going to focus on the ways that I've attempted to link critical discourse analysis and critical narrative inquiry using my program of research on um, the reconstruction of aging and retirement as sort of the backdrop to talking about uh, that methodological uh, playing that I've done. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, introducing the study and the methodological challenge that I based in trying to operationalize and carry out this study. I'm going to give you a bit of a background regarding positive aging discourses because when I start to talk about how I'm doing the narrative analysis and attempting to link it to discourses, it's good to know some sense of how I'm seeing those discourses. Then I'll talk about the methodology and methods used in the study and then really focus on the approach to analysis and interpretation that really kind of happened in process of interacting with the narrative data from this study. And, and try and get at what I'll be calling the in-between, the in-between between discourse and narrative. And then end off with a, with a few sort of critical reflections, both on this methodology, on what I've been able to sort of uh, show through it, and its broader applicability. So in my ongoing research, and this research actually started with my dissertation work with, with Dr. Robertson, um, and then I was fortunate enough very early on in my academic career to get the, one of those three-year grants from SHRP that don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And then um, from that sort of piece together funding to kind of do this research over basically a 10-year period. And that has been great because it's allowed me to do the research in, in different ways and with different people. And basically in this research I'm trying to look at the interconnections between the ways retirement and aging are being discursively constructed, um, mostly within the Canadian context, although I've had the pleasure to do some work with international colleagues now, and also look at how people narratively position and monitor and negotiate their selves, their, their daily conduct or their occupations would be the word that I would use for that, and their bodies in relationship to these discourses and how their narratives challenge the taken, granted, taken for granted positivity of positive discourses. And uh, what I'm really doing is trying to adopt a critical stance and look at how the contemporary experience of aging and how people negotiate aging is situated within a broader social political context. And hopefully through that, raise awareness of the boundaries and inequities shaped through how we're discursively constructing aging and interrogate how aging and retirement are being reconfigured in ways that may be less about promoting health and well-being for aging individuals and actually be more about minimizing the economic and political consequences of population aging. So what was my methodological challenge? So I'm going to start off with um, just some very broad definitions of discourse and narrative because when you go to the literature, those terms are defined in multiple ways and sometimes in very contradictory ways. And as, as I move through the presentation, I'm going to be, become much more theoretically specific about how I'm using those terms. But in general, I'm using the term discourse to mean the broad, socially constructed systems of meaning about a discursive object. So in this case, within society more broadly, within policy, within media, within popular culture, within academia, how are we constructing aging? What are we saying about aging? And then narratives as the stories that people tell about their own aging, about their own personal experience and how they're trying to construct who they are and how they're situated in the world through their narratives. And so in trying to link these, the basic uh, 
assumption is that when people tell their narrative, that narrative is bounded within that broader discursive context. We can only tell stories that make sense in the context in which we exist. And the boundaries of that context are the larger discourses. So if I want to talk about myself as, for example, a mother, I'm drawing on broader discourses of what it means to be a mother and how I should be as a mother to convey who I am as a mother. And so that's how I'm seeing the, the two connections. So the methodological challenge for me in linking discourse and narrative relates to that key sociological challenge which Joan introduced me to between structure and agency. So how do we look at the relationship between structure and agency but do that in a way that we're not seeing people as overdetermined by structure or we're not seeing people as totally free from structures and how can we look at the in between? So essentially how can we link discourse and narrative so taking narrative data from individuals to actually move beyond the level of the individual to use narrative data to look at historical, social, and cultural realms and make critical analysis possible on a social level, but avoid the binary of either seeing people as either the autonomous origin of their experience or some kind of pawn of social determination. So I'm going to now step back and just talk a bit about positive aging discourses. And so I'm sure everyone in the room is aware how best to respond to population aging is the central problematic of contemporary governing, nationally and internationally. And how, and how to deal with issues like retirement, pensions, healthcare, and work are key foci of this sort of policy dilemma of population aging. So in my research, I'm really interested in how this problematic of population aging has come to be discursively shaped within policy, within media, within academia, and how this shaping informs what solutions are proposed and enacted, both at a policy level, but also at that level of individuals aging in the world and trying to negotiate aging in the world. So at this very broad level, population aging is often discursively framed as an impending crisis, imbued with risks to global and national economic health systems, connected to things like rising dependency ratios, sustainability of public pension systems, and the overburdening of health care. In turn, the need for governments to take action to reduce income, social, and service supports for older people is emphasized as vital to avoid some kind of impending fiscal crisis, as is the need for individuals to age in responsible and positive ways. And this is where we begin to see the promotion of positive aging discourses. So the discursive construction of population aging as a crisis has been tied to particular kinds of policy responses that have involved a redistribution of responsibilities and risks over time. So in line with neoliberal approaches to governing, these policy responses increasingly reconfigure problems like later life poverty, once conceptualized as social issues that were deserving of publicly funded services and supports, into individual risks and responsibilities to be addressed through proactive lifestyle choices and self-management. Such policy directions, the most recent being the raising of the age of eligibility for old age security, seek to activate aging citizens who are seen at risk of dependency and passivity into citizens who reflexively and responsibly manage various aspects of their lives and risks, particularly within the consumer market and the labor market. So at the same time we might raise the age for eligibility for old age security, we increase the room that people can save for in their RRSPs, right? So we're shifting people into privatized ways of managing retirement. These policy changes have contributed to and been sustained by the rise of so-called positive aging discourses, which concurrently emphasize self-management of aging and its risks continued active engagement and working against dependency. So I'm not saying that constructions of oldness don't exist. So we still have constructions of oldness as dependency and disability and decline. Um, but there's much to say that this notion of positive or successful aging is becoming increasingly pervasive, particularly at a policy and popular culture 
level. And so these quotes just reflect some of um, the locations. So we see academically successful aging or positive aging being very pervasive. Um, within healthcare, it's becoming a very pervasive model guiding how we deliver healthcare to aging populations and also within policy. So what, is, what do such discourses look like? So this is the first time I've explained positive aging discourses in one slide. So <laughs> stay with me. This is usually, you know, this is a whole part of my program of research and this could be the presentation by itself. But, so I use the term positive aging discourses as an umbrella term to encompass various variants of aging discourses that emphasize the possibility of aging well in particular ways. And I talk about this as a triumvirate. Um, that over time, um, initially, positive aging discourses were really about being forever young. So the call to be youthful, right? And we still see that call. Then, as we healthcare became increasingly a concern, we have the call to be forever healthy and to begin to begin to practice health very much in midlife as a way to prepare ourselves for later life. And I think more recently, we have the call to be forever productive. So the notion that staying in the labor force for a longer period of time is actually a way to age well. And these three things connect to each other. So if we're forever productive, we're likely forever young and forever healthy. If we're forever healthy, we're probably youthful and we're probably productive. So these discourses are tied together by particular emphases. One being the idea of dis dissociating age and disease. So a lot of things that were once thought of as age-related problems are reconceptualized into problems resulting from lifestyle choices, inadequate knowledge, inadequate preparation, um, inadequate um, engagement in particular kinds of body practices or body monitoring practices. So the idea is if we can engage people to age more positively, we will not see the same kinds of diseases and chronic disabilities in later life that we currently see. Um, such discourses also transform later life into an extended midlife. So this idea that we can hold out and, and avoid or del at least delay becoming old in that sense of dependent or disabled. A particularly pervasive element of these discourses is the framing of aging as an individual responsibility that can and should be controlled through being informed, making the right lifestyle, financial, and other kinds of choices, engaging in the right risk management, and staying active in the right types of activity, often tied to body work, consumerism, and being productive. So a final um, feature that often ties these various kinds of positive aging discourses together is they attempt to reshape population aging and individual aging away from a problem to an opportunity. So if you look at a lot of the, um, for example, the WHO policy documents or the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, we have this shift from population aging is you know, going to throw us into to fiscal crisis to this idea that, oh, this is going to be an opportunity that we as a society can take advantage of. So at first glance, such discourses seem highly facilitative, and that's why we have words like positive aging, healthy aging, successful aging, right? So there's a very positive language around these discourses, and they're often celebrated within policy within media, within academic disciplines, including gerontology, and within healthcare professions. They're often celebrated for reconfiguring aging, creating a more positive way to age, enhancing aging individuals' rights, challenging ageism, and combating structured dependency. And I'm not going to say that they're totally negative, and I'm not going to say that good things haven't come out of the promotion of positive aging discourses. However, my concern is how these discourses have been taken up within a particular political climate in ways that may actually work against the very messages the discourses are trying to convey about being healthy in later life. And a growing number of authors have highlighted the need for critical analysis of such discourses, particularly how they've been taken up politically and within consumer culture and within healthcare raising concerns regarding the ways they shape new expectations for activity, identity, and citizenship, and how they're embedded within particular power relations and political thought systems. 
So a lot of work on aging discourses has been done in the UK and in Australia, but not a lot in Canada. And so when I began to encounter this literature and think about what I was interested in, this is how I sort of developed my program of research to really look at how is this happening in Canada? How are these discourses being taken up? And then how are individuals negotiating these discourses? And in doing that, I'm using a particular theoretical frame, and again, this is all going to lead to the narrative aspect, it's all building up there. And the theoretical frame that I'm using to look at positive aging discourses is a governmentality perspective. So I'm looking at discourses as a technology of government. So the governmentality perspective builds upon Foucault's work to address how the governance of everyday life is achieved. Basically, how how do various kinds of social authorities within this sort of expanded notion of, of government, so people like healthcare professionals, educators, researchers, policy make, makers, how do their actions serve to guide the conduct of everyday life by people within society? And government also encompasses government of the self. That is the process through which individuals take up discourses and discursive messages to monitor themselves and to work upon themselves and their bodies and their daily conduct. So in considering how the government of everyday life is enacted, scholars draw upon Foucault's notion of power as productive. And they see power as operating through the production and circulation of knowledge, partly through discourses, which outline ways to think about reality to think about the self and to think about everyday conduct. So understanding how truths regarding positive aging are shaped, circulated, and become taken for granted aspects of everyday life requires attending to discourses as technologies of government. So as techniques that produce and circulate morally laden messages that aim to shape conduct, aspirations, needs, desires, capacities of specific categories of individuals, to enlist them in particular strategies, and to seek defined goals. So first, I have to stop myself and say, OK, how do I do this without being deterministic? Because certainly, the governmentality perspective and, and work within the governmentality perspective has been critiqued for being too overly dis deterministic, for losing the subject or losing the agent. And while there's the sense that there are particular discourses connected within relations of power that do become dominant forms of knowledge that, that we sort of live within and we have to react to, there's also a sense that multiple discourses exist, alternative discourses exist, and discourses are never fully coherent. So when you begin to break down positive aging discourses, which I do in another part of this research, you begin to see the contradictions inherent in the discourses, right? They promise that you can live forever at the same time that there's an underlying sense that life will end, right? So there are contradictions within the discourses that allow people to fracture them or to modify them or to be creative in how they take them up. And so in my work, I'm trying to both look at how they're shaped by discourses, but how people actually negotiate and modify discourses within their narratives. So subjectivity or possibilities for personhood are proposed to be an essential object of contemporary governing. The idea is that modern societies are increasingly organized and governed through discourses about the self as an object, providing people with ways to think about themselves as a particular kind of person, so as an aging person or as a retiree or as a mother and then providing guidelines on how to monitor themselves as that kind of person and how to behave as that kind of person. Discourses addressing subjectivity therefore make, seek to make up particular kinds of ideal subjects and act upon people's sense of who they are and who they strive to be as part of a collective such as youthful retirees or older workers. A particular relevance to my program of research as an occupational science and my interest in sort of everyday occupation, a term I used to mean the, just the everyday activities that people do, is that government is seen as intimately linked to everyday doing, as involving structuring the possible field of actions of others. So we're governed through this idea of idealized subject positions that are sort of put out there as subject positions to work towards to take up 
But we're also governed in that those ideal subject positions become associated with a set of activities we need to engage in to work towards being that kind of person. So if we want to be a youthful retiree, discourses give a set of, of activities we should be engaging in, like exercise, like eating the right kind of food, like engaging in particular kinds of social activities. So they outline the kinds of everyday conduct that allow us to work towards that subject position. So technologies of government and discourses are bounded within particular thought systems or rationalities. And this thought system sort of sets the boundaries on how discourses begin to coalesce. So if we look at positive aging discourses, be they called successful aging, or healthy aging, or active aging, or productive aging, they coalesce around particular kinds of values, aims, and practices. And the argument is that coalescing happens because they're framed within a particular thought system. And in this instance, they're framed within a neoliberal political rationality. So drawing this all together, the way that I'm looking at positive aging discourses is that they shape new types of aging citizens and outline particular possibilities for being and doing. And they aim to enlist aging citizens in a moral duty to age well and outline what that means to age well. So they outline the values associated with that, the activities associated with that, and what that looks like. What does it mean to age well? And they do this in ways that align with the neoliberal emphasis on individual responsibility and autonomy, proactive individualized management of the body, financial and social risks of aging and retirement, and through the use of rational decision making within the consumer and private market. So that's how they sort of pull us. And so this idea that they promote an ethical obligation to exercise responsibility, to manage risks, and this becomes our enactment of citizenship obligations. Our moral duty to our community is to age well within a particular way. So as I stated previously, although from this governmentality perspective, it's proposed that discourses have implications for how people see themselves and how they act in the world. Very few studies have actually examined how actors are embedded in positive aging discourses. How do they understand these discourses? Do they take up these subject positions? How do they negotiate these subject positions? And how do they see their own activities in relationship to these sort of idealized forms of activity promoted through discourse? So I now turn to the narrative part of the research. So in connecting the perspective on positive aging discourses as a technology of government with narratives, I draw on the notion of bounded agency. And this is taken from the work of Vickerstaff and Cox, and Vickerstaff is a, a critical gerontologist. Um, he draws on life course theory as well as gov a governmentality perspective. So, in conveying and constructing their narratives, individuals are viewed as agents or actors in the world who creatively draw upon broader social discourses in constructing their subject positions and explaining who they are, but they're also seen as position subjects, positioned in relationship to discourses and constructing their narratives within the range of sensible constructions, is the word that Ainsworth and Hardy talk about, so limited range of sensible constructions. I would add ethical or moral constructions of the behaviors and practices they should be engaging in as a particular kind of subject. So because discourses are not fully cohesive and actors are often embedded in multiple discourses, so we have discourses of age, we have discourses of gender, we have discourses of social class, we have multiple kinds of discourses we're engaging within. In looking at narratives, there's this space for creativity or resistance. And the other thing that I would add to the notion of bounded agency is that particular individuals may have more power and resources to negotiate discourses than other individuals. And that's something else I'm trying to look at in my analysis. So in the narrative aspect, I'm using critical narrative inquiry as my methodology. And based on an ontological position of historical realism, this approach to narrative inquiry aims to question and deconstruct socio-politically constructed versions of reality or discourses that are circulated and become taken for granted within a particular societal context. 
So many of these positive aging discourses permeate our contexts. For me, they're everywhere, but I'm looking for them. But they're in our media, they're in our policy documents, they're in the textbooks I use to teach my occupational therapy students. And so we be they've become sort of taken for granted or reified as this is what it means to, to age well or age positively. So trying to deconstruct those through using narrative data. So a critical stance is taken regarding the status quo. So in this case, seeking to draw upon narratives to question these dominant, taken for granted constructions of aging well, and trying to link those with larger political and economic questions related to neoliberalism. So in this, in terms of conceptualizing narrative, using a more constitutive view of language, narratives aren't seen as a mirror of how life has been lived. So I'm not looking at narratives as a report of how someone actually lived their life. I'm also not looking at narratives as some kind of reflection of the person's inner world, but rather I'm looking at narratives as a way that people attempt to construct themselves, to convey themselves. So narratives as a form of social action and social performance. So as a form of social action, when people tell a narrative, they attempt to accomplish particular versions of themselves. They attempt to convey that version to someone else, and they actually attempt to convince themselves of that version of themselves as well. So narratives are active, dynamic, and fluid. The narrative that I collect as a researcher sitting in a room with someone is specific to that context. And so I need to think about what narrative are they presenting to me within this context, and I need to contextualize that narrative and know that if they were to tell that narrative the next day to someone else, that narrative might look very differently because the subject positions they would call on within that context might be different than the one they're going to call on talking to me as, as an interviewer. So in terms of context, it's important to look at the immediate context of the interview in, in the performance of the narrative, the local context of the informant, as well as this broader discursive context. And all of those contexts come into the narrative as resources that are drawn upon. And so I'm really looking at discourses as a kind of resource that people construct or negotiate within the construction of their narrative. So how did I collect narratives? Um, so in terms of this study, we ended up collecting narratives from 30 informants through a multi-stage process, and I'll talk a little bit about the sample later on, but basically we were asking for people, and we had people self-identify as people who were either preparing for retirement or who had moved into the retirement years, because we wanted to collect narratives of preparing for or preparing for and being in retirement. And so we went with an age range of 45 plus, and there's, there's literature to kind of say, typically around your mid-40s is when you begin to start to envision what you might, who you might be as a retiree, and you begin to think about what do I need to do to move towards that vision of my retirement? So we used Ben Graf's biographical narrative interview method. We didn't use his method of analysis, but we used his method of narrative elicitation. And for me, one of the method's challenges was this was the first study where I actually had money to hire people, right? <laughs> and so prior to this point, I had done my own data collection in every study, right? So I knew my data in and out because I had been the person who had collected the data. So now I, I faced this strange tension of, oh, I've got to hire people and they're going to collect some of my data. So this was one of my challenges. I don't, no one's ever talked to me about this challenge, but it's certainly a challenge I felt, an attention I felt, because I wanted to go out and collect all the narratives. But when you're in a faculty position, you've got this, you know, this other 40, 20 thing you're supposed to do. <laughs> that doesn't seem to work all the time. So we ended up having four interviewers, and, and I did do you know, five of the interviews myself, and then we, I had four doctoral students who um, were hired as research trainees on the grant. And so for me, it was really important to think about how, how do I keep this together? It wasn't that I wanted to, to have the interviews be reliable or to be you know, the same. I realized that with different interviewers, these interviews were going to look differently, and, and that would be part of what we would need to analyze. 
But I also wanted to make sure we were kind of all in the same headspace when we were going into these interviews and thinking theoretically the same way and thinking method-wise the same way. What do we mean by narrative elicitation? So these poor students had to meet as a group, <laughs> um, you know, probably every two weeks as we were collecting the data and we just sat in a room and talked about what were your interviews like and what are you thinking about, what kinds of insights and what worked well for you to elicit narrative and what didn't work so well. So that way I felt like I had a sense of what was going on in the field. And then um, with each first, you'll see there's two interview process. With each first interview, I sat down with each student and went through the interview with them and we talked about what was going on in the interview, what they were thinking about, and we came up with some prompts for their second interview. So again, for me, that was a way to kind of stay connected to the data. A really important thing in this interview context was most of the interviewers being doctoral students and even myself, tended to be a lot younger than the people we were interviewing, right? Not when I was interviewing someone in their 40s, that was okay, because it was a really different context. And I could see the way they were talking to me was very different than I went when I went to interview someone in their 70s. And then the doctoral students were substantially younger than me. And so that was a really specific contextual feature of these narratives in that people were telling their narrative about moving into retirement or being a retiree to someone they perceived as younger than them, right? So that was part of the positioning. How do I convey this to this younger person so that they can understand what it's like? And so we had lots of examples of how people even set up the interview, uh, the context of the interview to kind of um, portray that they were a young retiree. So one that comes to mind, one of our, um, the doctoral students was a, a male and so there was phone contact before, so you kind of knew who was coming to your house. And so this person knew it was a doctoral student, and he was interviewing a man who was in his late 70s. So when the doctoral student showed up, the man was out in the front yard breaking his leaves. <laughs> and then in the first five minutes of the narrative, the, one of the first things this man said was, as you saw me raking the leaves, <laughs> you can see that I'm a very physically fit 78-year-old. And then he went on to sort of position himself and talk about how he did all of his home, home maintenance work and all of his lawn care. And so we had many people who very early in their interviews, you know, would say, some of the, the older women would say, I know you can see I have wrinkles, I know you can see I have gray hair, but I want you to know that I don't think of myself as old. And so we heard that over and over again. And partly that was a reaction to who the interviewer was. So we collected the, the narratives in, in two sessions. In the first session, we used what Wen Graf calls a SQUIN, a single question for eliciting narrative. And basically, um, we asked people, I would like you to tell me your story of how you are preparing for your retirement years, including all the events and experiences which are important for you. And that was it. And we let them tell their story. And for people who were already retired, we asked a second prompt was, and tell me your story of moving into and being in your retirement years. And we were all nervous, and we thought, oh no, nobody, people are going like, to look at us and go, what? And we'd had different responses. We had people who talked in response to that question for an hour and a half. And the interviewer had to say very, very little, right? And we had people who took maybe 20 minutes, and then we moved into the second phase. And so the second phase for Van Graaff is as the person's telling their story, you're writing down topics in the sequence that they're talking about them. And in the second part of this first interview, you just revisit the topics in the order that they told them. And the idea is that you're staying with their narrative line and their narrative topics. So you just go back to the topic and sort of ask for elaboration on that topic to try to fill out the narrative. So in the end, that first session varied between 45 minutes to almost five hours for one individual who who started his story of preparing for retirement as when I was a child <laughs> and went through his whole life story. But the narrative linkages made sense that he made in his story. Other people started off with, you know, five years ago when I realized I was 10 years away from retirement. We went back in the second session. In that second session, we went back having read that first narrative interview, having sort of plotted out the narrative and done a little summary of that narrative and having talked to at least one other person about what were the things we wanted the person to elaborate on about their narrative. And so in that second session, it started off with the interviewer giving a summary of the narrative from the first session, 
and then the person responded to the summary, and then we had some prompting questions for further elaboration. The other thing we did at the end of the second session was some photo elicitation. And that, the photos that we used came out of the discourse analysis part of this study. So having done discourse analysis of media, I had some categories of kind of major types of subject positions that seemed to be forefronted in the media. And we used photos that I had selected as representative of those different kinds of subject positions and presented them to people after they had said their narrative and asked them, could they relate to the photo? How did they relate to this photo? So some of them were photos of, for example, one was um, you know, a very visibly older man rollerblading. And one was uh, a very visibly older woman sitting in a wheelchair in a very institutional looking setting, but in a flowery dress and with a big smile. And so people were just sort of asked to talk about how did they relate to that photo? Did that photo relate to the story of their own preparation for retirement? So in the study, we had 30 informants, and we tried a diversity of recruitment strategies, but this was done in London, Ontario, and London only has a particular kind of diversity in terms of its older citizens. So in essence, I would describe this sampler as primarily resource-rich. Um, they range in age from 45 to 83, most identified as retired. <laughs> Um, and their mean age of retirement was 58.6. So we had some people who were still working within the sample. The majority were married. The majority rated their finances as adequate. The majority had completed college or university, and they lived in a private home in an urban setting. And they rated their health as good or excellent. So obviously, as resource-rich sample, I think in many ways, I was interviewing people who had the resources to engage in positive aging if they chose to and had the, the ability to take up practices. So in doing the narrative analysis and interpretation, I aim to look at the individual narratives in relationship to how they reflected the complex ways everyday lives and subject positions are negotiated within these broader discourses. So according to Hardin, this requires reading between the language of personal narratives and broader discourses, so moving between the individual words and the social cultural discourses. And given the multiplicity of discourses and subject positions, individuals may negotiate, so in relation to age, gender, culture. Harding and others suggest that in any particular analysis, it's necessary to strategically, temporarily fix a set of meanings. So when I first started looking at these dis the narratives, I mean, people were talking about their gender, and they were talking about their age, and they were talking about their, you know, their, their um, work history, and there, there were so many discourses at play that it became really muddled. And so this idea of fixing and saying, okay, I'm really looking at how they're talking about age, and know that, you know, I'm sort of putting gender to the side at this point in the analysis, um, which doesn't really help if I wanted to do an intersectional analysis, but at this point, it was really important for me to kind of fix that and focus on age. I was also interested in this idea of illustrating systems and practice. So making visible how varying conditions and resources bounded the abilities of individuals to negotiate subject positions, so for example, economic resources. So I found lots of methodological texts that beautifully told me what the aims of this analysis should be. So if you're going to look at narrative and discourse, these are the things you should aim to do. I found very few concrete examples of how to do it. So, after reading through the interviews for each informant and plotting out the major storylines of their narratives, I tried out various ways to read the narratives and various ways to try to think about how do I connect these to larger discourses and these relationships uh, with subjectivities and practices. So then I began to draw on my theoretical underpinnings and my conceptualization of narrative, and I began to write out a set of guiding questions for my readings and codings of the interviews and use these guiding questions to try to engage in a critical reading of the narratives um, versus a sort of more o open reading. So some of the questions that were really helpful was to think about what ways the informant positioned themselves within the narrative, what subject positions they attempted to lay the claim to, and how did they do that? How did the ways of positioning relate to subjectivities constructed through positive aging discourses? Were they taking them up? Were they negotiating them? Were they fracturing them? What kinds of normalizing truths, what kind of expert knowledge did they bring in 
to their narrative, or did they contest in their narrative when they talked about reflecting on themselves, positioning themselves, and presenting themselves and their bodies and their activities. And so I finally get to the actual data. Um, so doing multiple readings and using these questions and trying to code the narrative data, through doing the analysis, I found there were particular points within the narratives that were really fruitful points to look at the links between discourse and narrative. So, I'm just going to talk about them briefly and then I'm going to illustrate them using some data. So one more points of resistance. Well, people would explicitly articulate that they were doing something or saying something that they thought was against the grain or they thought wasn't what they should be doing or what they've been told to be doing. And so those tend to, to be very fruitful moments within a narrative to try to think about links. Points of seeming contradictions and fractures, because we talk to people over two points in time, we at points could see them actually contradicting themselves when they're within their narratives, right? At some point saying, you know, I'm a really physically active senior, and at another point saying, and this is one of the examples I'll be sharing, I really exercise very much, right? And looking at those contradictions or the fractures in their narratives to try to look at what was going on within the narrative that led to that fracture and how might it lead to contradictions or fractures within broader discourses of aging. Points of tension within the narratives. These were points where informants set up differences between themselves and others. And these differences often were about marginalizing or blaming others for being failed agers. So they would point out how they were good and other people were bad. Or the flip side, they would share stories where other people had blamed them or marginalized them or had treated them in ageist ways. And so those became really important points. And then from Chase, this idea of narrative link with linkages. So the way that informants made links between how they were living their life and the resources and constraints in which their life had been lived. So their explanatory frameworks, their cause and effect frameworks, again, not taking those as what really happened, but how do they explain how things happened in their lives and what rationales did they draw? So I start with Mrs. S. So Mrs. S um, presented one of the most coherent narratives in relation to positioning herself, and she called herself an active retiree. She had retired 10 years prior to the interview at what she considered to be a very young age, and had received a retirement package and a private pension. So she was economically quite well resourced. When she was interviewed, she was working and volunteering about six hours a week as a musician, and she had retired at the same time as her husband but was separated at the time of the interview. In many ways, Mrs. S. appeared to have readily taken on several ideal aspects of being an I, of being an active retiree, and she highlighted engagement in bodily practices and activities promoted within contemporary discourses of positive aging. She described herself as feeling too young to sit around in a veg state and waste her time following retirement. She explained that she therefore took on another career as she was a young retiree and wanted to be an active retiree. Throughout her narrative, she emphasized how busy she was and stressed that she was doing what she should do and what she ought to do. So she emphasized how it's really important for retired people to do something with life because they should be active as long as they can be. In relation to narrative linkages, Mrs. S, in line with positive aging discourses, connected her activity involvement and her choices to being youthful and being healthy. She framed it as part of her obligation as a responsible aging person stating she was trying to keep as young as heart as she can and doing the very best to be young and fulfill her obligation to prolong this healthy stage of her retirement. In, in reading her narrative, at sometimes I felt like I was reading um, a book about positive aging. So concern has been raised that actually positive aging discourses that stress staying healthy and staying youthful may perpetuate ageist attitudes against those who do become old and may actually lead to this sort of victim blaming of people who look old or act old or who are disabled in later life. And several points of tension in Mrs. S's narrative surfaced when she discussed her relationships to other aging and older people. And we can see this othering 
and hints of ageism, and we can see victim blaming. So she positioned herself like the happy and positive aging people promoted within television ads and as having made the right choices. In her discussions of others she saw as old and who she chooses to be friends with, she very clearly socially distanced herself from oldness. So you see old people being overweight, can hardly walk, gray hair, those aren't the seniors I know. So she hung around with seniors who were fit, active, also active retirees. She also, her narrative also raises concerns about this idea of blaming others who don't meet the demands of aging well and ignoring the structural conditions that limit their aging. So she stressed the positive outcomes of her choices and implied that other people might experience negative outcomes as a result of poor choices and irresponsible behaviors. So I know there are people who are financially troubled in their retirement years, but I certainly thought about that years ago. So as I said, there are very few points of ten contradiction in with, within Mrs. S.'s narrative. She very strongly presented herself as an active retiree and very strongly presented herself as doing the things she should do. The only point of tension or contradiction was around this notion of physical activity. So in her first interview, she positioned herself as part of a particular generation of aging individuals who should keep ourselves as physically fit as we can so we're not a burden to others. And in her case, in particular with her children. Near the end of her second interview, she began to question whether she was doing enough and talked about having difficulty keeping physically active as I should. And she did talk about and try to explain that. She talked about separating from her husband and that had been an emotionally difficult period in her life. She talked about the fact she didn't like to exercise, she got no pleasure out of it, so she had reasons. But ultimately, she went back to the idea that she should be doing it. And so she talked about not being faithful, about it nagging her, and about this being something that she felt she wasn't living up to. So the opposite example is Mrs. D. So I call her the resistor in my sample. So she had retired three years prior to the interview from a management job and had worked for 30 years and, and had been let go um, and took a buyout package. She talked about feeling partially retired as her husband was still working. And in many ways, she positioned herself very early in her interview as actively resisting this idea of being productive or being a uh, later life worker. And she initially described herself as currently quite happy to sit at home and be a homemaker. She stressed that she was enjoying the freedom of the retirement, tying this freedom to doing what she wanted to do on a daily basis. Seemingly contradictory to this idea of being busy and being productive, she indicated she didn't want any commitments to deal with, particularly if it had to do with being at work or being a volunteer. Mm -hmm. However, there were several points of tension within her narrative. She expressed experiencing guilt in relationship to what she thought she, be, she should be doing, even though she described being content with her life as it was. She stated, I'm not sharing all this free time I have, because I think in a lot of cases, expectations nowadays are if you're retired, you should be pursuing something else. You should be starting a business. You should be volunteering. I get guilt feelings over that. I get guilt feelings over the fact, my God, you've done nothing all day. It wasn't that she wasn't doing anything, but the things she were doing were things that she could label as productive and useful within her discursive environment. She also discussed how her awareness of broader expectations to be active meant that she couldn't label her activities as productive and affected her everyday choices. I, if I sat and read all day, that would probably not be a great thing to do because it's not a productive thing, even though it's something I might like to do. So while resisting, Mrs. D still needed to negotiate herself and her activities in relationship to positive aging discourses. In relation to points of fracture, although Mrs. D very strongly talked about being very happy with the way her life was, at other points, she expressed inner tension about her activities and individualized her failure to not live up to societal expectations to be productive. It's an inner thing I'm manifesting within myself because I'm not reconciling myself to accepting what I'm doing. The norm is you're expected to do this all, all this marvelous stuff, and it's just not easy. She also talked about sort of living with this larger expectation and struggling to represent herself as being a responsible person. So it's hard for me, I've been very responsible. I've been a very, very responsible person. If there's something I should be doing, then I should be doing it. 
In relationship to her narrative linkages, Mrs. D tried to explain why she wasn't an active nature. She tried to explain why she wasn't productive. And she talked about her family history, about her local context, relaying how her mother and brothers had died young and had not had time to enjoy retirement. So within this local context, she basically said, life is so short, I don't feel that I want to commit myself to anything, I guess. However, at the end of her narrative, Mrs. D expressed ambivalence regarding her future, including her ability to continue to resist this call to be productive, indicating maybe sometime within the next few years, I'll look for a job or I'll do more volunteering. So I hope you're seeing how she's sort of playing with this discourse and attempting to resist it, but at the same time, not able to fully step outside of it. So two more brief examples. So Mr. F is an example of someone who attempted to take up being a pro proactive working retiree, someone who basically tried to plan so that he could continue to work into later life. And his narrative fractures the linkages made in positive aging discourses, which basically say in choosing to continue to be productive in the, in the labor force, um, aging individuals will experience inclusion, they'll experience youth, they'll experience feeling that they're still contributing. So he had retired 16 years prior to the interview, and he indicated that as he was approaching his retirement, he didn't feel ready to retire. He felt he wanted to, he had to, things to contribute. He didn't feel old. And he also had some financial concerns. Because he was a manager in human resources, he had the position and the power to negotiate a part-time contract position that he thought he would just live out for the next 10 years. So he framed himself as setting this up. So I came back with the idea, well, I'm 64-ish. I could eliminate my position and come back and work part-time. I could act as a consultant. However, Mr. F's strategy did not work as he expected, nor did it result in the outcomes promised within positive aging discourses. He described feeling displaced and marginalized during the six months he worked part-time. He talked about being on the shelf, as his co-workers perceiving when his shift to part-time was the beginning of his exit and feeling that it would be good when he actually did go. He also described workplace practices consistent with ageism, which could not be overcome through his individual actions. So positive aging talks about, hey, look young, feel young, act young, and you can work through ageism. He described that while they gave him some work, it was pretty insignificant stuff. And for the first time at work, he felt insignificant. And he got the message that his co-workers felt the sooner he goes, the better. So he accepted these ageist practices and social relationships as the way it was, as just what happens when one ages. These sorts of practices are obscured by positive aging discourses. The last example is Mr. J. In contrast to Mr. F, he did not have power or resources to negotiate work options as he aged. He had not completed high school, and his work life had consisted of a series of manually oriented jobs. His last time full position, full time position as a trailer mechanic ended unexpectedly when the company went broke. And at that time, at the age of 55, he took a reduced pension, and he thought that he could just go get another job like he'd done throughout his whole life. Over the next 10 years, he engaged in several part-time temporary jobs, describing that he took whatever work he could get, along with unemployment, and he got by until the age of 65. At the age of 80, when he was interviewed, he and his wife had sold their family home for the income and had moved to a small um, apartment. His narrative points to structurally shaped conditions that create inequities amongst aging individuals, differentiating those with resources to take up idealized subject positions and practices from those who cannot, thereby helping to fracture the reality, the so-called reality created through such discourses by showing that some people don't live that reality, but that's not a reality for some people. He stressed he had no chance to plan for retirement. It just came on me. Boom, you're done, meant he didn't have a chance to plan good. As I said, he thought he was going to go out and get a job like that, but at the age of 55, he found out that the job market doesn't want a 55-year-old manual laborer. In turn, he meant he had to take little jobs in unemployment and never had a chance to put money aside. So, rather, he lived with reduced pensions, having taken his public and his private pensions early in order to get by, and having not been able to save money due to a 10-year history of intermittent job positions. So Mr. J, um, at the age of 80, still in line with positive aging discourses, stressed he would sooner be working. 
and he would work some would work today if someone would hire him because he's always looking for something meaningful to do. He expressed that living with reduced pensions and having sold his house, he struggled to find meaningful activity. Although he was involved in a local senior center and he golfed, he described struggling with do he described he struggled with doing nothing, hanging around and the restrictions of living in an apartment. So contrary to the discourses of positive aging that celebrate the increasing opportunities for meaningful activity involvement, available to modern active agers, Mr. J, within his limited economic and housing resources, struggled to find meaningful occupation and attempted to create this for himself. For example, picking up garbage in his apartment parking lot as he had to have something to do. And these are the images of aging that we don't see within our positive aging discourses. So, in conclusion, in connecting discourses and narratives, critical narrative researchers don't claim that the interpretation offered up is the only interpretation possible, nor is the claim that these are somehow generalizable of the particular ways that people connect discourses and narratives. The point for me is to use narratives to raise questions about the boundaries that are set through discourses, the possibilities that are opened up for what and for whom, and who becomes excluded and marginalized. So I think for me, engaging in this study has really helped me to increase my own awareness as well as other people's awareness of how positive aging discourses influence the ways that people make sense of their aging and the ways that they negotiate their aging. And they also helped me to fracture the notions of choice and opportunity that sort of embedded are, are embedded within these discourses by showing that some people don't have the choices or the opportunities or some people don't want them or don't desire that image of aging. And I think I see these discourses as part of a broader individualization of the social. It's not just aging discourses in which risks and responsibilities are being shifted from society to individuals, but this is occurring in many domains of relevance to health. So this idea of looking at discourses and how people negotiate them, I think, has some broader relevance. Just as examples of some of the, the critical reflections coming out of this work, so positive aging discourses shape beliefs regarding the failed and the good aging system, and also, or citizen, and shape action and inaction towards that citizen. So in the narratives, I saw tensions at this individual level between being a good ager and a bad ager between marginalizing people you saw as not aging in the right way um, and distancing yourself from those people. And I think the more that we begin to blame people for their aging or the conditions of their aging, the more that um, we can justify as a society pulling away from things like pension and healthcare systems and other kinds of support for people in later life. I also think that despite the claims that positive aging discourses are all about working against ageism, I think this, this work shows the way in which they actually perpetuate and extend ageism. They create very few positive possibilities for people who don't live up to the expectations of aging well, and actually marginalize them even further through this sort of victim blaming and this, this sense that if only you had made the right choices, your life wouldn't be the way it is. So last slide, um, I think for me critical work is really about being acutely aware of the context in which claims about how one ought to live are advanced. And I see my role as a critical researcher in questioning some of those oughts that are circulated within society and questioning who do those benefit and who do they not benefit. And what I hope to demonstrate today was that looking at the interplay of narratives and discourses is one way to question the the messages that permeate society about how we should age and how we should not age, and what a good citizen is and what a failed citizen is. And I will conclude there.